But this week I read a, uh, the autobiography of Buck Owens and uh, any guesses on what the, his autobiography was titled? I got a tiger by the tail. No, buck him. <laughs> which I just thought was pretty funny. Good, good. I was hoping for something like, I have no bucks left to give or something like that. <laughs> but <laughs> what, we, what we'll find is that his sound was specifically a push back against the Nashville machine. And something else I took away from this week is that I can't wait for us to do a James Brown episode because we know that James Brown is called the hardest working man in show business, but I think Buck Owens might give him a run for his money because this man played nonstop for like 50 years. I mean, from the time he was 15, he was playing seven nights a week. We'll get into that, but it was a, a newfound respect for, uh, for what he did. And then lastly, Phil, go ahead. No, I got nothing. And I did mention, you know, in my opening tweet about being bedazzled, I just, I love the style of what they were doing back then. Again, it, it was almost like a time machine. It was the 60s. And if you haven't had a chance to go see what these guys looked like, I don't know if the song Rhinestone Cowboy by Glenn, uh, what's so, his name? So uh, Glenn Campbell like has written about them, but they're covered in rhinestones. They're wearing bright pink, blue, and yellow suits. And, it's and they're just probably like wild. matching. It's like this era oh, yeah. of like matching yeah. country nudie suit sort of thing, yeah. right? Yeah, cool. It, or not, but you know. <laughs> no, I, I agree. I mean, the, interesting. interesting. The visual is important. It's, I was struck by the fact that it's just this whole different world that I had never entered into nor will I return watching these guys in their outfits, having these long standing TV shows for decades. It's wild. Now, before we dive into the history and background, I need a moment of your time. And no, I'm not yet hawking our merch store, but we're about a week into the new year. And fellas, I was putting together my 2024 vision board and in hopes of holding myself accountable. I'm going to say this out loud on the podcast, my 2024 New Year's resolution is to get Aubrey Plaza on the podcast as a guest. You heard me shooting for the stars here. Oh, man. The Delaware goat. <laughs> yes, exactly. And for she those, strikes me. Yeah, for those who may not have picked up on it, we're from Delaware, which is a rather <laughs> small state in the union. The and first state, should we a say. A couple of times, right. And she so is one be... Aubrey Plaza. And she seems like somebody who would have some hard opinions on the minutia of her favorite music. And I feel like a guest spot with us could really catapult her career to the next level. So totally keep you in the loop. But there's only so many Delaware celebrities. So as you all, of course, know, we tried and failed to get George Thurgood on the podcast last year. And I think Ryan Philippi is the <laughs> other big. If I recall from high school, that was the big deal is that people knew where his parents lived. <laughs> it's like, oh, Ryan Philippi's parents. All right, and that's a great spot for us to dive into the backstory of this album and of one Buck Owens. Now, this is definitely not the oldest album we've reviewed. I think that title goes to Sinatra or Elvis, which I think was 55, 57. And Buck Owens, though, starts his career early in that era. You know, his first singles were dropped in 1956. But the album that we're talking about, I've Got a Tiger by the Tail, was actually released in 1965. So the story of Buck Owens, the music legend, both begins and ends on a long stretch of the, of the Pacific Coast Highway in California, which we'll get into in a bit. But what do you... Sorry, did I say something? Sorry, you're laughing. I'm like cracking no, up. Now. No. You're just thinking about the Aubrey Plaza thing. <laughs> the actual story uh, begins when Alvis Edgar Owens Jr., which is his actual name, is born on August 12th in 1929. Did you Bilbo, what's Alvis? his first name? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's what Alvis. Yeah, that's what I thought you said. <laughs> Not Elvis, Alvis. <laughs> He's he's been he's been trying to get at Elvis's uh, uh, coattail since his birth. Apparently, I think we need to focus on that for another step. Is that is that a real name in the world? <laughs> Hang on, let me let me let me Google. Reminds me of like the Elvis. board license plate. Right. <laughs> right? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. We're all out of board license plates. So Possibly, that means so that implies yeah. that Elvis himself was a. I guess I'm surprised at two things. One, that Elvis is itself a variation on another name called Alvis. 
And two, that a man born with the name Alvis didn't just roll on with that one. That's pretty cool. I know he had to. <laughs> and by the way, it's uh means all wise in old Norse. So there you have it. So it is an actual name. Now, he was born in 1929. According to his mother, he was born in the back of the family's Ford Model A sedan. So he, by the way, night, August 12, 1929, this is three months before the great stock market crash. So he's that's born the great, right that's on great. That. No, 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 no. That's, that's the money spot. Because think about it. Every fucking day, your life's getting a little bit better. This dude, when he was 18, 19 years old, the war's over. He didn't fight in it. And shit's only getting better. That's the money spot. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> and he died before everything got crazy again, right? <laughs> Sweet spot in there. So he was the son of sharecroppers. They moved around a lot that's, early that's, in his that's life. That's the money spot, too. <laughs> Sharecropping. Yeah, you definitely. You, that you definitely. don't want to be a sharecropper. You want to be right. the son of sharecroppers. Yes. Yeah. Oh, he worked. That's that's not the money spot. That's not a good gig. (laughs) Nobody wants that. You know, so he comes from a long line of farmers. His father was a farmer. His mother's father father was a farmer. And the way sharecropping worked is that somebody owned the land and then they basically lent the land out to these different families who would farm it and then give the owner half the produce or half the, the take. And then they could either keep half for themselves or sell it. Not a very glorious life and buck was working in the fields by about the time he could walk now at age eight the family had moved around to six different cities at this point in texas but they had another move up their sleeves because they soon joined the okies which was a term originally used as to describe people specifically from oklahoma who moved west during the dust bowl to try to find work and try to find farms that were actually working but it eventually came to be a kind of an umbrella term that just meant anybody who fled the Midwest to California to escape the Dust Bowl. And as the Grapes of Wrath told us, everything was pretty much great from there, happily ever after, right? California oh, was, had streets paved to gold and uh, absolutely they rich. Yeah, exactly. Spoiler alert, that's not... Well, it's actually kind of how Buck's story ends. So the, <laughs> they're heading out to California He's eight. They squeeze into this the same 1933 Ford uh, sedan that he was born in, and not a very luxurious trip. They literally would pull over onto the side of the road. They had a mattress and a trailer. They would put that like on the side of the road in the field, and the kids would sleep on a mattress on the side of the road. Eventually, their car breaks down, and they wind up settling in Mesa, Arizona. So for the next few years, the family were day laborers, picking potatoes, tomatoes, all kinds of great produce. And it's where Buck forms this foundational memory, one that would would drive him for the rest of his life. He remembers being cold all the time. This is a Bob Dylan song. You've just (laughs) you've just told the story of many Bob Dylan songs, I feel like. (laughs) It's like crazy shit happens. Maybe you're it's in your control, maybe it's not in your control. And then there's this heavy one liner, like cold all the time. Cold (laughs) (laughs) Except he's except the Dylan line's way better. Oh yeah, it's it's much deeper. But he he had this mantra in his head when I grow up, I ain't gonna be cold, I ain't gonna be hungry, I ain't gonna be poor. And In 1940, the father and the kids are working in these labor camps. They're traveling out to California. They called them labor camps, which feels like forced labor, but it's basically all of these farms. Everyone would get together and live in kind of these like small shanty towns in California and then go off to the fields and then come back. And they they called them labor camps. And his father would pull them out of school two weeks early and send them back to school two weeks late in order to, to get the most out of the season. And now at these labor camps is where Buck really gets his first introduction to music because everyone's depressed. And what do you do when you're depressed? You play music. So there were banjo players and fiddle players and mandolin players. And this is where he really started hearing music for the first time. Yeah, just to be clear, I don't think that's why they called it the Great Depression. It wasn't based on the emotional state of the human beings in the U.S. (laughs) Although it very well could have been, it seems like. (laughs) So by 11 years old, they're back in Mesa, Arizona, and a young buck would go to school every Saturday. This is, sorry. So he's 13, buck drops out of school. All right. And he drops out of school to help haul fruit part-time. I don't know what that even means. I don't know if he was driving the truck or if he's just moving boxes around. He's still in 
Mesa at this point? He's in Mesa, Arizona. Okay. And he gets a mandolin for Christmas that year. And that was the spark that he needed. So we flash forward two years. He's 15 and he's already playing in honky tonks in Phoenix, making about three bucks a night, which was more than he was making in the fields. So this is in 1944 at the height of the war. Buck is too young. His father was drafted, but was not sent overseas to fight. And again, this realization that he can make more money playing music than he can in the field. So he starts hustling hard on the music thing. So he gets some gigs at a tiny radio station, being a DJ. And that helped him kind of see a little bit of how the industry works about how, you know, these 45s would, would go around the country and get played on these tiny radio stations. And <clears throat> around 15, maybe a couple of years older, he joins a band called Max Skillet Liquors, which was, which did weekly. Yeah. They need help on their names. Yeah. All right. I do like a long band name, so it's got that. Yeah, there you go. All right. Yeah, Skillet Leakers ain't bad. Kind of cool. So Max Skillet Leakers had a had a radio concert every week from a gas station bandstand. And from there they went on and kept playing around Mesa, Arizona for years. And that that paid more than field work. That was like better than minimum wage or whatever. The gas station bandstand was more than picking fruit. Serious question. Does it currently pay more to be in a band than to pick lettuce? Uh, it's a good question. I don't. Low I don't. point in the music industry right now. I, I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure. All right. So he's 19. He's gigging in Phoenix six nights a week, $5 a night plus tips. And one thing I noticed about his autobiography is he's constantly mentioning how much he's getting paid and how much he's making at these different gigs. Again, he hated being poor. He never wanted to be poor and cold again. So every time he mentioned a new gig, he's throwing out, well, yeah, look, 20 bucks, 30 bucks, 40 bucks, 50 bucks. It was just kind of funny to watch that progression. So in 1951, he's around 21, 22 years old, and he moves himself and his young family. He'd gotten married and had some kids. They moved to Bakersfield, like, like Rob had mentioned at the top. And this would prove to be the most important move yet of his life. Uh, sorry, Adam. I, yeah. Scenic Bakersfield. Scenic. Now, I'm not familiar with, with California and Bakersfield. Rob, tell me a little bit about what, the, what it's like now. I think you know everything you need to know, Adam. It's not, I, you don't want to go there, definitely. From the descriptions in 1950, it hasn't changed much. Apologies to our Bakersfield listeners, but uh, it's pretty low on the list of California destinations. <laughs> All right, so Bakersfield in the early 1950 is full of Okies who are working in the oil fields and farms. Translation, there were a lot of people looking to get drunk and cut loose after spending 100 hours in the fields and in the, the uh, oil fields every week. Yeah, oh, sorry. So there's plenty of honky-tonks, plenty of bars, plenty of places to get loaded, plenty of places to play music. So that same year, 1951, he lands a gig at a honky tonk called the Blackboard, where he's now playing guitar and singing with a group called Bill Woods and the Orange Blossom Playboys. Phil, another long name for you. That's a pretty good name. That's a great name. That's a fucking great name. I would play in that band today. <laughs> Can we define honky tonk? Have we ever defined that? Is that just a bar with music in it or does it mean something else? So I've heard it referenced as almost a type of music and the location as well, but I'm picturing it's just rowdy electric country is what I'm associating from what I took away from the book. What was that band again? That was Bill Woods and the Orange Blossom Playboys. Dude, I'm, I'm ready to play those gigs. That sounds pretty good, Rob, <laughs> right? Let's like, do it. Let's do a revival. Electric, electric, country. Yeah, electric country with the orange. So Bill Woods was a guitar player and a band leader who would eventually be called the godfather of the Bakersfield sound. So it wasn't, you know, Buck didn't necessarily invent this Bakersfield sound, but he was the one who ran with it, really popularized it. Now, if, if you're like me and you're not very familiar with country, let alone ancient country, uh, it comes to these different, I know I keep calling it that, but it's kind of true. There's all these different sounds, right? So you've got classic Nashville, which Chet Atkins crafted. 
and was basically put into the mainstream by Elvis. You've got Texas Swing, which, which was pioneered by a guy named Bob Wills. Bill Monroe was at the forefront of Kentucky yeah. Bluegrass. And then Buck Owens, who took what Bill uh, Bill Woods had kind of created and then ran with it. Can you give us some style hallmarks? Is it about the backbeat? It's got a little more rock and roll in it. Like what's it's a little more rock and roll and it's more raw. So I would say that the the Bakersfield sound, as Buck described it, was basically a rejection of the Nashville sound, which some purists thought was too too often trying to have one foot in pop and one in country. So in that Nashville sound, you've got a lot of choirs, there's string sections, it feels very produced. Buck makes it sound like the Bakersfield sound is really, it's just more raw. It's more, uh, it's less, less polished, I'll say, and I, more electric. Yeah, I would say listening to it, like, it definitely sounds a little more like in the current times, in that I hear like the hard panning, right? Is in yeah. all where the Nashville stuff is not really comparable to Phil Spector, but there is more of that wall of sound sort of thing. There can be a lot happening. And it's and it's not necessarily all overdubs. Okay, that makes sense. Is it so? But it's also about song topic. Do you think as well, Adam? I don't know that I saw much on that. I mean, I feel like a lot of you know, to read some old Loretta Lynn and some Elvis and Buck Owens, and I'm not sure there was a ton of ton I've of. I always heard that about the movement that came a little later, which was the outlaw country movement, the Willie Nelsons. And we, we even talked about Willie Nelson on the Redheaded Stranger episode, rejecting what Nashville, the box Nashville wanted to put him in and moving to Texas. And then ultimately he became associated with this movement called Outlaw Country with Waylon Jennings and a few others. And I thought that was about subject matter, that they were more willing to talk about okay. criminal activity and things like that. Yeah. Well, yeah. And it sounds like Nashville was a machine and they had a formula. There are stories where Buck goes out to Nashville and he's playing at the Grand Old Opry, and it is very regimented. Like, you can't use your own amp. You can only do this. We're going to control your EQ. Your drummer can't have that cymbal or that floor tom. And it was very... Uh, hmm. Yeah, yeah. Like, like there's a red X on the stage. You go stand You there, have to hit your mark. There, right. There's and, a silver X over there. That's where the bass player stands. Like, <laughs> and Yeah, and, and Buck hated that. Because, again, he he's playing, you know, 300 nights a year in live again honky tonk bars where things are a little a little rough and tumble and yeah. to get you know pushed into that scene he wasn't a huge fan of well and being a live musician like that you kind of know what works you know what the crowds are responding to so you have your own idea of the thing and then you go to some studio and the guy says no no this is how it, this is what people will like it's like screw you man i know i know because i've been playing 300 nights a year <laughs> right right doing the research dog <laughs> <laughs> now this was the book I read was an autobiography. So not sure how much of this is, is tall tales, but Buck said that when he was playing with the orange blossom playboys, they would play from 3 PM until 2 AM, 11 hours straight, seven <laughs> nights a week, no intermissions, no stopping, just going constantly. Now that, that sounds kind of silly. Who knows if that's true, but I mean, the guy was not a hard of, was not afraid of a hard day's work. I'll say. So, and these are with like two and a half minute songs, we should point out. Yeah, right. So they were, <laughs> they were running through. 600 songs a night. <laughs> <laughs> now, luckily, there's only three chords in the entire genre. Yeah. So, <laughs> and all the melodies start sounding the same, too. But now, somewhere in the mix of all this gigging, Buck meets some other musicians and gets a gig doing some studio work in Los Angeles. So jump forward two years, and in 1953, Buck gets a call to be the guitarist on a session at Capitol Records for a guy named Tommy Collins. He gets paid $41.25 for this. The song that Buck played on was called You Better Not Do That, and it was a pretty big country radio hit. So the guy who cut it, this guy named Tommy Collins, he lands a gig at the Grand Old Opry in Nashville, and he brings Buck for the, for the show. And this is where I mentioned where Buck immediately saw the luster of Nashville kind of fall off because he goes there and he has no control over his sound, where he is on the stage, how loud he can play, all this stuff. So he was stunned that Nashville was that controlling. So it really put him off. So can we talk, about, hold, can we talk yeah. about Bakersfield for one more sec, though? Because now it occurs to me, did you get the sense, Adam, that 
Bakersfield, I guess, is in a place in the Valley of California where there's a lot of migrant workers and farm workers and things like that. Maybe it's one of the major population centers in an area like that where people are going to bars and wanting to kick off steam. But at the same time, it seems like maybe it was musically fruitful because it's close enough to L.A. where you could pop over to L.A. for one of these sessions, right? Right, right. Yeah, geographically, it made sense for him and worked out well. I realized, too, just to follow up on the Bakersfield comment, the Bakersfield is the kind of town in California that you write a song about to, to give a very specific negative feeling about your song, to tell a story. It's in the same category as Lodi, I want to say. Uh, OK, yeah, yeah. Yeah, there is some song. It might even it's not Glenn Campbell, but there is a song about uh, Bakersfield. I think it's a little more puts a, puts a, a nicer sheen on it than than Lodi, but. So Buck comes back from Nashville, and at this point, he's even more adamant about having his own sound and doing things his own way. And in 1954, he's one of the first guys to pick up a Telecaster in country music, I'll say. Other people were doing it. The Telecaster, I think, was invented in 1950. And he, at this point, is hearing early rock and roll and that rockabilly sound, and he wants to give that a shot. So he writes a rockabilly single and releases it under a pseudonym called Quirky Jones because he knows that these diehard <laughs> these diehard country fans will run him out of town if it's discovered that our country guy is doing other genres. It felt very territorial from what he was saying of what of what the audience wanted. Was that genre distinction purely because of the Telecaster? Because I feel like we should give the audience a little more clarity there. I know this was in the early days of electric guitars at all, but Telecasters, which is just another Fender product, another common guitar now, the same kind of electric guitar that Bruce Springsteen plays, for instance, but it became a country music hallmark after this, I was this, definitely right? going to ask, like, is, if, if Buck Owens is credited with bringing the Telecaster to country music, that's a huge contribution to country yeah. music. i mean somebody would have done it right somebody would have done like, it at some point I, but that's and yeah it's, big. it's kind of and it's, it, it, the characteristic right is that it's got a little bit of a brighter yeah tone to it I, I would honestly and i mean this in the nicest possible way i think a telecaster sounds like you got a nice two by four at home depot and put some pickups and a nice neck on it but it just sounds like it sounds like the wood that it's made out of more than any yeah. other type of guitar in my opinion okay mm. yeah interesting yeah. you hear the wood right and a lot of uh twang for lack of a better uh, word very right? very bright very high endy Nappy. right yeah and they, they battle you a little too i think more than any other guitar like you have to work the telecaster I'd say it goes from like Telecaster to Stratocaster down to Les Paul, which basically plays itself. Plays itself. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but you know, throwback, Adam. In there somewhere. I still have that Telecaster that you and I, you helped me pick out when I was like 17 or 16 at Sam Ash yeah. and King of Pressure. Oh. guitar. Yeah. Wow. All right. You should have brought it out for this episode. <laughs> All right. So Buck releases this single called Corky Jones. It doesn't really do much but he wanted to just get get the rockabilly out of his system so he continues to do studio work in LA and just for some context too about what these country studio sessions would look like is you would go into the studio and in three hours you were expected to pump out four songs as in done like end of the day they're cutting them to acetate thanks here's your $50 and then they turn around and in two weeks, it's they're sending it out across the country or giving it to radio stations. So there was not a lot of obsessing over studio magic and production and stuff like that that we're used to. Well, I think, I, yeah, I think that tracks with, you got to remember that I think it was the Beatles really that came along or one of the first groups that started using the studio as an instrument. It, it wasn't even thought of that way before, right? Maybe, maybe a Phil yeah. Spector but even then in, in a sort of subtle way where he was just, it was just about mic positioning and, and mixing and stuff. So the idea that the studio is just a tool to get what the live band sounds like, end of story. And yeah, the songs are all fairly simple in construction. That's not a knock against them. So it, it kind of makes sense. 
and you're ripping them 300 nights a year so like the band's as yeah, tight it's, as the band's gonna get right you know, and they, they are tight there are some i think it's like episode one of the buck owens show because later on he he starts his own television show and they are tight i mean the harmonies are perfect yeah. this guy don rich that we'll meet in the story in just a minute a remarkable guitar player just such such touch so early on that uh yeah i mean you just stick a mic in front of them and there's your album and, and in general i mean like i i do think the country there's long been a very high bar in the country music circle for like the players and, yeah and i remember several years ago the song jolene like sort of made a major comeback maybe like five ten years ago and i remember there being a version of it played down like the 45 played at 33 speed you know yeah, 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 I remember. And the band sounds just as fucking good. Like in theory, <laughs> so you'd tight. Hear them, they wouldn't sound as tight, right? Right. Like, but no, no, they're fucking airtight. They sound better. What but I remember, yeah. I'm sure intrepid listeners can still look up that YouTube video of the Jolene 45 slowed down to 33. But I remember so, it getting posted to a bunch of music blogs as this basically could be. It's just Dolly Parton slowed down, but it could be a modern band reimagining the song like it still sounds really good i think morphine might have been referenced as somebody who would sort of do a down tempo version <laughs> right, of it right. all right so buck is in the studio again he's back in la and he's playing with a group called the farmer boys they brought him in as a guitar player and he's kind of subtly feeding them songs. Uh, their producer didn't know that uh, Buck is kind of like slipping the lyrics and chord charts and everything. And so uh, they're recording and the engineer comes over and, you know, they finish the song and they're like, okay, who's, who's the writer? Who owns that? And, and Buck Owens keeps speaking. I was like, that's mine. That's mine. That's mine. So the producer gets the idea and said, okay, maybe we've got something here. So Capitol Records signs him in 1957. And by this time, he's been playing in honky tonks and bars for over a decade, virtually nonstop. Again, like, you know, 200, 250 to 300 gigs a year he's doing. And he's mostly a singer, guitar player. And now we're talking about songwriting. But I also heard an anecdote that he played sax and drums in some of these sessions. Did you hear that? Yeah, he he picked them up kind of just being around them. I think he also plays a little pedal steel. He didn't play pedal steel with the Buckaroos, but he also apparently picked that up as kind of one of his additional tricks. I think the pedal steel might be the hardest instrument in the world. Jeez, man. <laughs> so and when they when you play it well. That up, you know? <laughs> yeah, how do you pick that up? Yeah. So he gets signed and six months goes by and Buck hears nothing from Capitol Records. So he's getting a little nervous and wondering if he made a terrible decision. And not only is he not making any money, but he's prevented from making any money anywhere else in the music industry. And that's a perfect spot for our favorite segment, By the Numbers. So first, I'm going to hit you with the number 32. That's how long this album is. <laughs> remarkably, <laughs> remarkably short and sweet. So they banged the out like five albums in a session then? Yeah, right. <laughs> a weekend session, here's your next 10 years worth of albums. <laughs> the number 10, which was the number of family members that squeezed into that Model A Ford that he was born in in order to leave Sherman, Texas and drive west to Mesa. They fit, I'm picturing the Beverly Hillbillies with the grandmother on the top of it with like right. the, uh, right. the rocking chair tied to the top of it. It couldn't have looked much different than that, like a total Dr. Seuss moment. I mean, they had those bench seats in the front and I was explaining to someone the other day who seemed flabbergasted about how we used to ride in the back of the station wagon without seat belts, and that was like a I exciting moment. Horrified. I was talking to my father recently, and I was like, yeah, I rode in the back of a pickup truck, uh, like on like a highway, not like I-95 or, you know, I-5, but on a highway to a grade school baseball game with many of the players on my team, right. and the coach drove us. Yeah. And my father was like, yeah, of course. Just That's fine. Yeah, duh. Yeah. yeah. There's <laughs> enough of you. You'll all just, kind of just get in the back of that pickup truck and just roll can... around like some, some cinder blocks. That's fine. Can you imagine? You're in charge of getting the kids to the Little League camp tonight, Adam. And you're just like, throw them in the back of the pickup truck. 
<laughs> seven young boys in the back of the pickup. Yeah, no, I'm not oh, kidding. No. I really, really like. I think. Uh, no, nah, I'm just gonna stop there. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're going to move on to the number 14, which was the number of albums out of 15 that Buck released between 1963 and 1967 that went to number one on the Billboard country music charts. Dang. All right, the number the number 400,000. That's how much money he made each year for 17 years from 69 to 86 starring in Hee Haw later on in his life. A move that some people... That no. must have felt that must have felt really good after making yeah, right. like, you know after well, feeling good about three bucks like for the all night gig, right? It seemed like he didn't care. He reached a point in his career. Well, I think it was in 1969 is when he jumped into Hee Haw. And he said a lot of people, you know, couldn't take him seriously anymore. They like saw like this mega star who like lowered himself to doing these cheesy puns and jokes and everything. And he's just like, yo, give me that money, man. He's like, I'm <laughs> I'm not going to be poor, man. I'm never going to be poor. Give it to me. And it just sounds like he didn't care. I, I mean, good for him. You know, yeah, seriously. it's like, you know, it's just like, I just know who you are. Own it. You know, it's fine. All right. And the final number here is 18. And that's the number one. That I'm sorry. The number 18 is the number of number one hits on Billboard country music charts that he had between 63 and 69. Dang. So let's jump back in. All right. So six months go by and Capitol Records eventually brings Buck into the studio and they tell him all about the 1001 album complaints Patreon page. And they told him <laughs> to worry and that this podcast will always be available and free, but that the 1001 crew wanted to give people an opportunity to drop some love and appreciation for all the hard work and research that goes into every episode of this show. Buck said that? And he did. It was the damnedest thing. And Buck said, you're fucking kidding me. Right. Get, the, get the fuck out of here. Because he was physically unable to curse without invoking his own nickname. <laughs> so, yeah, we've got our Patreon set up. People can give us five bucks a month. Think of it like buying us a beer or drop us a one-time tip or do nothing and keep enjoying what we hope is a one-of-a-kind podcast experience. Either way, thanks for listening. I gotta go get more water. I'll be back in a second. No problem. All right, so now Buck is with Capital, and they cut a song called Come Back, which we'll drop a little bit of right here. All right, now Buck is pissed. He didn't curse, <laughs> but he's pissed. Dang tootin'. He absolutely hates this. He doesn't even want to release it. He can't stand the treatment that they did to it. Buck said that they used a group that was trying to sound like the Jordanaires, who were a gospel group that sang on those early Elvis records. They sounded good with Elvis, but didn't make sense to have them on my record, is what Buck said. So it's no surprise to everyone that they were trying to basically recreate Elvis. Heartbreak Hotel was released in 56, and that sold. And so they wanted to recreate that. So Buck, again, he called the Nashville sound. He said it, it was syrupy. You know, there were string sections. It was very heavy handed that they were trying to get a pop crossover. And ultimately, they were trying to elevate country music to get past the hay bales, as he said, which I thought was funny. Hold on. Just he, does, isn't he trying to get that bread? Like, why, I know. Well, why, why would he be against this? Yeah, that's maybe it wasn't until he really got his real taste of money after he started getting some singles that he was like, OK, I have no I have no scruples. I'll do whatever you do. <laughs> so Capital does release this song and it bombs. And after that, that bombed, he's still gigging. He's selling ads on a radio station. And just by gigging and those the radio gig, he was making $82 a week. 
which was the most he'd, he'd ever made in his life, and none of that was coming from Capitol Records. Now, shortly thereafter, Dusty Rhodes, the pedal steel player, not the wrestler, uh, <laughs> Wait, was in. Because I've was, I was, I was already been thinking about the honky tonk, man, this entire right. podcast. <laughs> now you're bringing in Dusty Rhodes? <laughs> So Which he, is, by the way, a great country band name or song. Uh, <laughs> oh, totally. So unbeknownst to Buck, Dusty Rhodes hires a fiddle player, a guy named Donald Eugene Ulrich, a.k.a. Don Rich, who was really the other half of this Buck Owens story. Now, Don is super young. Don is only a junior in high school when he joins the band. He's like 16 or 17 years old, and Buck would actually drive like a half hour to get him every day from school uh, to bring him into the rehearsal space for band practice. So at this point, Buck is pretty miserable that he's making no money with Capitol. And he sends a letter to Capitol Records and says, you know, I'm out and uh, I want to part ways. And well, that's not the way contracts work. So you can't just politely bow out of it. But Capitol says, look, we'll let you do what you want. Uh, you can produce, you can write the songs you want and, and we'll support you. So they cut a song called Second Fiddle that made it up to number 24 on the country charts. And it was high enough for Capitol Records to ask him to keep making more. So there's kind of this magical moment that Buck talks about in the book where they're driving uh, to and from Tacoma, uh, I'm sorry, from Tacoma to LA somewhat routinely for a, a radio gig and for studio work. And the band is in the car and Dusty Rhodes is driving and he asked Don, the new guy, to sing along some harmonies with Buck. And so Buck starts singing, Don chimes in and this light goes off and Buck realizes like, we've got something here. This is amazing. This guy's voice is fantastic. He's a great player. Uh, we get along well. And so uh, they had something very special there. It was kind of a key moment in the band's evolution. Wait, hold on, did you say Tacoma, Washington? Yeah. It's not like it's got to be like a 20 25 hour hours away. drive in my modern car going 90 <laughs> miles an hour. Yeah. What was it like in the uh, the Model T or whatever the heck they were driving with Granny <laughs> on the roof? It was a three week drive. Well, that's actually when they were up in Tacoma, that's where they had another little uh, drive by with Loretta Lynn. Loretta Lynn was discovered up there. So oh. if you recall, Loretta Lynn was driving around the country trying to get her recording career off the ground. And she showed up and actually played on this show that Buck Owens was hosting in Tacoma. Wild. All right. So, uh, in 1960, after a TV appearance in Nashville, uh, Buck decides that he's, he's finally done with Nashville and he wants to go back to Bakersfield and people think he's crazy. And all the folks in Nashville are like, you can't cut a number one country record outside of Nashville. You're nuts. Go ahead, ruin your career. Have fun. All right, so now kind of a rapid fire of, of the years leading up to this album. So in 1961, they got a gig opening for the Johnny Cash show, which was a touring show that Johnny Cash was doing. And people loved him, and he started building a fan base. Yeah, I think like June Carter and the Carter family were like part of it. It was like a, it was like a, like a festival essentially yeah yeah exactly yeah they would do that they would tour around the country with five or six acts you yep. know think of like All you know the, sort of thing yeah the new kids on the block going out with six other washed up yeah. bands and uh don't bring boys <laughs> the men into this don't, don't bring in <laughs> n-y-k-t-o-b-t-k-y all right 1962 buck decides to put together his own permanent band instead of just playing with these random studio guys and merle haggard who was sitting in and playing bass for them for a couple of weeks suggested the name Buck Owens and the Buckaroos and it stuck. And this is where uh, around 61, 62 is where they're playing 300 gigs a year. So they're getting really tight with this, with this newly formed band. 1963 act naturally becomes Buck's first number one song released as a single, all those years of struggle and hard work finally paid off. And, uh, it sounds silly, but they made a big deal. I watched a documentary about him, and there was a moment in 1963 where both Buck Owens and Don Rich each were playing a Telecaster on stage, and people were, like, losing their minds. Like, people were running out from backstage, like, what the hell is that sound? It's like, well, it's just it's two. There's two Telecasters <laughs> being played at once instead of one. But 
apparently it was a big deal. Sounds kind of silly now, but potentially breaking some new ground in that electrified country sound, which it could have been that at that moment, there was not an acoustic guitar being played in a country song. And that could have been a really big deal at the time. Hmm. All right. So 1965, another key year because the Beatles covered yeah. Act Naturally, which was huge. Buck was was definitely a Beatles fan. Uh, couldn't really say that, though, because, again, these country purists, his fan base was was so so into country that if you strayed at all, they were likely to, again, that would uh, be, that makes no sense, by the way. I know it would be like if Jay-Z covered one of my band songs. And I was like, I can't even say that's cool because. (laughs) 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 Well, it might explain why. And I'm just thinking about this now, generationally, if your country fan base is so dedicated and they're threatening you that if you play or sound different, we're going to leave you and they're all old people, then maybe you do stay locked in, Rob, to your point, for a decade. A sound that started in 1955 and you don't want to quote unquote alienate people. So you stick with with what worked. I think, though, there's always that pressure on artists that they might they're in danger of alienating a fan base that they gained through a certain sound if they were to change that sound. Now, the veracity of those different fan bases throughout time may have shifted, but there's always, I'm just pointing out that anyone who has any, even a dose of fame feels some version of that. And that's why we give extra credit, I feel, to artists who push back against that, like the Beatles. Mm -hmm. Have the guts to to break that that tradition or, or whatever it is. All right. So here we are. We're in 1964 uh, and Buck records. I got a t- caught. I don't even know the name of it. Hang on. Got a I've tiger, got a by, tiger the by the tail. Thank you. It's 1964. Buck records. I've got a tiger by the tail at the height of his popularity. And as a single, it was actually a crossover success on the pop charts. It wasn't a number one hit, but just like me, the song peaked at 25. So now before we jump into this, <laughs> I want to tell you a little bit about Buck before we jump in, because he obviously had had a, a relatively long life after this album came out. So Buck was on his way up, no longer afraid of being poor. And by the mid 60s, he was one of the richest country singers of that era and basically became a gentleman rancher and was buying up radio stations all over the place out west. He would go on to release another 28 studio albums after I've Got a Tiger by the Tail. He also started his own publishing company. He built a recording studio and helped turn Bakersfield into an independent country music city. That's what he said. I'm not sure how true that is. I looked at some of the, again, I'm not a country guy. I I recognized one name, which was Dwight Yoakam. Apparently he came out of the Bakersfield area and kind of embraced that sound. And I think he even but helped, the, but in the, he helped Buck Owens come out of retirement at a certain point and do shows together. And they like cut an album together in the nineties. I want to say. Yeah. Yeah. You also dropped the name Merle Haggard. Isn't he, is he a Bakersfield guy? Uh, I actually don't know. I think some, he might I, be. Yeah. I think, okay. I think Phil might have that right. Yeah. Cool. So in addition to that, he gets his own TV show called The Buck Owens Show. And like I said earlier, he started hosting primetime Hee Haw. Again, he lost a lot of his truest fans. Uh, People just couldn't take him seriously anymore and thought he sold out. All right. Now, July 17th, 1974, Don Rich dies in a motorcycle crash on the PCH in California, kind of ending the journey where it began and buck was devastated was never the same he called don rich his soulmate at one point and he said uh, he was like a a brother a son and a best friend and there was a quote where he said something i never said before maybe i couldn't but i think my music life ended when don died i carried on and i existed but the real joy and love the real lightning and thunder is gone forever rough that's rough. Yeah, that's tragic for sure. 
So he would never. I mean, they were born like 20 years apart, too. Like, that's an unlikely friendship, especially to like find that kind of bond. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. So Owens would never really recover from this. But uh, Rob, like you said, he kind of, you know, came out of retirement um, with Dwight Yoakam, uh, I think in the 90s and and played, played some gigs. But Buck Owens dies in 2006 at the age of 76. All right. 